Good morning, friends. Welcome to River Church's online worship. We do this every week because we know that some of you, you're continuing to, to uh, isolate at home. We respect that. We encourage you to go with your conscience. And so this is just our way of saying we love you. Uh, and we want you to be included in the life and the work of our church. Uh, riverchurchrgv.com is our website, and you can find all the information you'd like to have regarding our, our church there. Um, I would also encourage you to go there and realize new ways that you can get connected in January. Now, you might say, well, Randy, how can I get connected with any kind of a small group, a gospel community? I'm not leaving my home. That's okay. We have several online gospel communities that we're rolling out in January. So go to our website and check that out. I'll tell you more about that later. Um, but for now, get ready. Uh, get rid of distractions. Get, get your Bible and something to write with. And, and we're going to roll with worship in just a minute. Good morning and Merry Christmas. Welcome to River Church's online worship. This is the second week of Advent and the overall theme that we're realizing during the month of December is Christmas cheer. Boy, do we need Christmas cheer. I mean, if, if there was ever a year that we needed a real Christmas pick-me-up, this would be the year, right? 2020. And so I'm enjoying December, and I'm enjoying preaching the good news of, of Jesus in December because we, le we need it like we have perhaps never needed it before. We need some optimism, some confidence, and some hopefulness. And, and what I want you to believe is that can be found in the story of Jesus Christ. Let's read the passage that we're camping out on for the month of December. Let's read it again. Um, it's Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah the prophet, he speaks into the weariness of the nation of Israel. And he says this, he says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. We talked about that last week. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Yeah, there's great cheer to be found this time of year, in this season. I'll say what I did last week. I hope you've already pulled out the Christmas movies and turned on the Christmas music and you're beginning to allow that, that cheer, that, that hopefulness that Christ brings to, to really permeate your soul because we need a dose of encouragement. And that's what I find in this story. Now, this passage was written 700 years in advance of the birth of the Christ child spoken into the weariness, the darkness, uh, the nation of Israel had really hit a low point. And so they're thinking, well, this Messiah, this Christ child is coming. He's going to bring joy, and it's not going to be in my lifetime. It's not going to be in my children's lifetime, but, but ultimately this will happen, and it will bring joy to our nation. Well, now it has happened. For us, we are recipients of this good news, the, the story of the birth of Jesus. And so into the darkness of our existence, God speaks, and his words are words of hope. And he tells the nation of Israel, your Savior is to be born. So Jesus is described in four ways in this passage. Uh, the first way we discussed last week, that that Jesus is a, a wonderful counselor. If you missed that, you can go, uh, you, you can listen to it uh, again sometime, or, or you can listen to it in the future, but, but, but a, a wonderful counselor. Uh, uh, maybe you've been to counseling. Uh, maybe you've gone and seen a counselor. Most of us have. And, and some counselors are, eh, 
And some of them, they just, they just empathize with you. They just, they just understand you. They just, it's like they've walked in your shoes. And, and Jesus, uh, in, a, in an exponentially greater sense, Jesus is a wonderful counselor, a sympathetic high priest. He understands you because he's walked in your shoes. That's last week's sermon. Uh, this week, we're talking about the fact that Jesus is the mighty God. And I'll unpack that for you. Next week, Jesus is described as the eternal father. How is that? I thought he was the son of God. Well, what we're going to talk about next week is the Trinity. There's a lot of misunderstanding and even ignorance regarding what the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is. We'll talk about that next week. And then the last week, um, week four of, uh, of Advent, we're going to be talking about Jesus described as the Prince of Peace. He, he brings peace. He has given us, his children, the ministry of peace, the ministry of reconciliation, bringing enemies together and making them friends, drawing our enemies in and making them our friends. That is our ministry, and it was founded on Jesus Christ's ministry. He is the prince of peace, and so we'll talk about that in week four. But today, week two... Jesus is the Almighty God. Now, the story of Jesus is the story of God. Jesus is God. And Jesus is superior over all other beings, over all all existence. Jesus is superior. So he's God, the word, the big theological word. I'm going I'm to geek out theologically a little bit uh, this week. I uh, hope you'll enjoy it. We're going to learn something together. Uh, the deity, Jesus' deity, that means he's God. And Jesus' preeminence, it means that he's superior over all existence, all beings. So, so, so Jesus' deity, he's God. And Jesus' preeminence, he's superior. That's what we're talking about. That's the story of Jesus. The story of Jesus is the story of God. It's hard. It's hard to argue that Jesus was just a good man. A lot of people say that. A lot of people say that they believe that. You know, I don't know if he was God, but, but, but he's a good man. I've had lots of friends who've told me that. I know Jesus was a good man, a good prophet. I'm just not sure he was God. I understand that a lot of people believe that. Maybe you believe that, and I respect that. But what I want to say is it's, it's hard to believe that Jesus was just a good man because he himself claimed to be God. So, so I mean, he's not a good man if he's a liar, right? Uh, unless... Unless he wasn't lying. Unless he is, in fact, God. I think for us as Christ followers, for us to have a robust, uh, a robust belief, in, in a strong belief in, in who Jesus is, I think that strengthens our faith. It, it, it gets us through another day. A robust view of who Jesus is. But it's hard for us as believers sometimes. We at times stumble. We're lacking in our faith. And it has historically been hard for, for even the most religious people at times to believe that Jesus was actually fully God. There are some, historically, there have been some classic stumbling blocks to this belief that have caused people to say, well, maybe he's a little bit less than God. Maybe he's not completely God. You know, the lie that I, I spoke of last week, or the misunderstanding at least, which is that he's half man and half God. Well, that's no good because if he's half man, he, he doesn't understand me because I'm fully man. And if he's half God, well, that does me no good because he's not completely able. But the Bible says that he's, he's completely man. He became completely man, but he's also completely God. So there's some classic stumbling blocks to the, to, that, that cause us to, to trip up in our, in our belief of Jesus' 
deity, the fact that he's God. And so we're going to address those stumbling blocks today and, and decide, okay, does the rest of the Bible affirm or confirm what the prophet Isaiah says, that Jesus is almighty God? It's one thing for the prophet Isaiah to say that, but does the rest of the Bible agree? So, some classic stumbling blocks uh, for us as human beings, arguments that people make against the deity of, of Christ, the, the preeminence of Christ, and then and what the Bible really says. So no, number one, the first issue we're going to deal with is this. Jesus has always existed. There was no beginning to Jesus. He has always existed. Before time began, be, before the creation of the universe, Jesus has always been. Now, maybe you believe that Jesus did not exist before the manger scene. I mean, I've talked to some Christians who maybe just haven't fully wrapped their brain around the fact that before the manger, before the manger scene, before baby Jesus was born, Jesus was. Jesus is. Jesus always will be. But maybe you, you haven't fully wrapped your brain around that. Um, maybe, maybe you think he first came into existence as the baby in the barn. Um, well, if there was a time when Jesus didn't exist, then he certainly is an almighty God. Because he must have been created by God if he didn't always exist. And if, if that's the case, then, then that would make him a little less than God. Which is precisely what Jehovah's Witnesses believe, that he is a little less than God. Ah, but, let me ask you, what are the first three words of the Bible? Do you remember? In the Old Testament... In the book of Genesis, what are the first three words? In the beginning, right? And that doesn't completely or doesn't, doesn't, doesn't specifically, those three words by themselves say anything about Jesus. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, well, you could argue, with, you could argue perhaps that God doesn't mean Jesus. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, so. That speaks of before creation. Now, now, jump way, way, way forward in the Bible to the New Testament in the Gospel of John. And do you know the first three words in the Gospel of John? In the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. Now, all biblical scholars theologians, including Jehovah's Witnesses, would say in the beginning was the word that the word, that the word word is code for Jesus. So this is saying in the beginning was Jesus. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Amen. You see what the author is doing? He is creatively borrowing from the, wor from the words of Genesis 1-1 to point to the fact that Jesus has always been in existence. He, Jesus, the creator of the universe, he was God, he was with God, he was in the beginning with God, and all things that were created were created by him. Jesus has always existed. That is what the Bible says. Now, let's go on. There's a second <clears throat> hurdle that we have to clear if we're going to believe that Jesus is the Almighty God. That hurdle, uh, the second hurdle would be <clears throat> an argument <clears throat> that Jehovah's Witnesses often make, and that is the saying that Jesus is a God, a less than sort of God, a God like small g God, and that God the Father is the God, large case, uppercase g. 
so, so this hurdle would say that, yeah, Jesus, some kind of a God, but, but not the God. Now, I've already said this. It's a fact that all scholars would agree that the word, word, in the beginning was the word, uh, in this passage that we just read, uh, it's code for Jesus. Um, even Jehovah's Witnesses uh, would agree with that. Um, but, <clears throat> but if you uh, have had them knock on your door, uh, I'm going to quit throwing stones at Jehovah's Witnesses here uh, in just a little bit. I've got some dear friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses. But if you had them knock on your door, um, what they will tell you is that the passage has left out an important word. The original language has left out an important word, the word the. So in verse uh, 1, some who are not Christians would, would argue that the passage should read, in the beginning was a God. In the beginning was a word or a God. In the beginning, I'm sorry, in the beginning was the word, and the word was a God. You see what they're doing. Uh, our English translation, and it's an accurate translation, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now they would argue that that simply means the word was a God. So Jesus is some sort of lesser God. I bring that out because maybe some of you have struggled with that belief or you've had other people that seemingly know the Bible better than you tell you that. What I want you to know, here's the truth. If you use that grammatically inaccurate language interpretation, which, the, which some false theologians do, um, then it messes up the rest of the book of, the, of, of, of uh, John. Because, like, for instance, verse, uh, verse 6, um, there was a man sent from God. Well, no, even false theologian would argue that there it means a God. They would say it means the God, but it's the exact same word. Even the Jehovah's Witness Bible uh, switches back to the God right there. So, so just, just rest in the fact that learned Orthodox theologians would all say that the accurate translation of this passage, it, it, you cannot get around it, that verse 1 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus pre, uh, pre existed. He, he, he was before creation, He's always existed. He was and is the Creator, and He is God. Um, to be consistent, to be grammatically correct, all the Bible scholars would tell you that the passage here accurately says that the Christ child who entered into human existence according to John 1.1 1, 1, was and is, always will be, the Almighty God. So again, this is consistent with Isaiah's description of Jesus in, in Isaiah chapter 9. Third argument or third hurdle that we have to wrestle with and clear, Jesus' obedience to his heavenly Father confuses us sometimes. Because we think, well, if I obey someone, then I'm less than them. They are superior to me. If I, if I have to uh, submit myself to someone. But what we forget is that there is a type of submission which is called voluntary submission. We wrestle with this a lot, don't we? We wrestle as a church with this language that Paul uses uh, that, of wives submitting to their husbands. And, and that, that, that passage has been hijacked and, 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 and sometimes used in abusive fashion. But, but, but literally, that is what the Apostle Paul is saying, submit to your husband. But what we tend to forget or never even teach is that there is a type of submission which is called voluntary submission. And it happens in a co-equal sense. No one is less than. And so, so that's what happens in Jesus' relationship to God the Father. They are equally God. Uh, there is a, a, an act of voluntary submission 
that took place in Jesus' life. For instance, he would say this. He would say, uh, I, I am here to do the will of my Father. You remember at the end of his life, he said this, Father, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. In other words, if I don't have to go to the cross, if there's another way to save the world, uh, save people from hell, forgive them of their sins, if there's another way to do it besides me going to the cross, then, Father, let that be. Let this cup pass from me. Yet, Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done. We know that, that Jesus... He was obedient to the Father. He was submissive in a voluntary fashion, submissive to the Father. And so sometimes we mistakenly think, well, then he must have been less than. I mean, there was consistently this attitude, this, this precious attitude on the part of Jesus um, to submit to the Heavenly Father's will throughout his time, his 33 years on this earth. And I suspect that was part of Jesus voluntarily humbling himself and voluntarily relying on God because the scope of Jesus' limitations uh, when he came to earth, this is what Jesus signed up for uh, when he agreed to take on human flesh. Uh, it meant that he needed to rely on the will of the Father um, due to the, the frailty of, uh, of this human nature that, that Jesus had voluntarily taken on. He didn't give up any of his godness, but he, he voluntarily took on the frailty of, human, uh, of, of humanity, this, this physical body that he had, and therefore he, he voluntarily subjects himself to that, and therefore um, he needs, he relies on the will of, the leading of the Father. But does this obedience to the Father mean that he was somehow less than God or somehow God light, if you will? No. The Apostle Paul states clearly, Jesus, he is the exact imprint, the exact representation of God. Hebrews 1 says this, Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, that's Jesus Christ, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He, that's Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power after making purification for sins jesus he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much superior to the angel to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs and then we skip a few verses uh verse Eight, um, we get a description of Jesus. This is what the Heavenly Father says. But of the Son, the Father says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. God the Father calls Jesus God. That blows my mind. I can't fully comprehend that, but that's what's going on here. And then in verse 10, uh, we, have, we have God, the Heavenly Father, speaking of God, Jesus Christ. He says this, And you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. So our Heavenly Father refers to Jesus as God. Our Heavenly Father refers to Jesus as the creator of the universe. Again, this all jives, this all fits well with Isaiah's prophecy. Jesus, the Christ child, is coming, and he is the Almighty God. Last uh, hurdle, um, big, big idea that I want us to talk about here is this. Jesus' humanity, the fact that he became a man completely, causes some to see him as just a good man. We talked briefly about that earlier. Um, was he? He was certainly a man, but was he just a man? 
I mean, you might struggle with this. I have. Why did he let people spit on him? And why did he let people falsely accuse him? And why did he let people crucify him? Was he powerless to escape them? No. Now, the Bible tells us that he was no victim. We needn't feel sorry for Jesus. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he had subjected himself to. And he was willing. Philippians 2 says this to us as Christ's followers. It says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In other words, be like your master, your savior, your Lord. Be like Jesus. Take on the mindset of Jesus. And then it describes that. Verse 6, Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He took on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself. By becoming obedient to the point of death. There it is. He, he humbled himself and he relied on God. He voluntarily submitted to God. He humbled himself and then he said, now I'm relying on you, Heavenly Father. Becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. <clears throat> Therefore, God, the Father, has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The Bible tells us that, that Jesus, he knew, he knew the reward that was coming, the salvation of humanity, his kingship and his lordship, and, and there he, therefore he endured the cross because he knew, he knew the reward that was coming. He knew what ultimate joy would, 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 would come to pass if he endured the cross. And so he humbled himself. And that doesn't make him less God. In fact, it makes him superior, preeminent deity God. So, what do we do with this powerful truth? That Jesus is preeminent. That Jesus is God. That he is, to use Isaiah's word, the almighty God. What do we do with that? How does that impact us? That's what we're going to talk about next. Okay, so I just want to briefly talk about what do we do with such a powerful truth? If it's really true that Jesus is God, that he's preeminent, superior, above all things, he's almighty God. What does that do? What does that mean for us? Well, first of all, let me point out kind of the negative, and that is, if he's not God, then what do we care about following the Bible? What do we care about gathering together for church? I say just try your best, you know, live it up. Oh, but on the other hand, if this is true, it, it holds for us so many blessings. So I, I, I would ask you to determine, to, to settle, to do you believe that Jesus is fully God? Do you embrace that? Do you embrace that with your heart and your emotions and your soul and your life? If so, if so, then you are now freed up to believe that, that Jesus went to the cross of his own accord, willfully, of his own design. And Jesus really did defeat death. And if Jesus is the almighty God, then he really did walk out of the tomb. And that opens up for you so many tremendous benefits. It makes sense out of life. It makes sense out of eternity. It says you're headed somewhere purposefully and ultimately as a child of God, you will receive this, this reward. This, the, you're an heir of all the blessings, the, all the inheritance that God has promised if Jesus really is the Almighty God. You know, the high point in the Gospel of John, we, we read John 1.1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was 
God, it's Jesus. But, but the high point in the Gospel of John, it happens in this, this quirky little story. Uh, when, when doubting Thomas came to this same realization, ah, you are the Almighty God. Let me just remind you of the story. Thomas was, was quoted earlier uh, in, in, in the story as saying, look, unless I see the nail scars in, in Jesus' hands, unless I'm able to reach my hand into the spear scar on Jesus' side, I'm not going to believe that he came back to life because he hadn't seen him yet. He hadn't seen the resurrected Jesus yet, and so he was a doubter, doubting Thomas. And so what he means is um, that he won't believe Jesus had the power, the authority to walk out of the tomb to defeat death unless he sees it with his own eyes. And so we, we pick up John 20. Um, it says this, Eight days later, Jesus' disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. This time he was there. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came right through the door, locked door, and he, he stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands. Put out your hand. Place it in my side. Go ahead. You said you wanted to do that. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Now, we have no record that Thomas actually went ahead and stuck his fingers in the scars, but rather, he immediately, Thomas answered him, My Lord, my Lord, and my God. And Jesus says to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Who's he talking about? He's talking about you. He's talking about us. Those who have not physically seen Jesus and yet we believe. And Jesus says we are blessed and that we do not literally see him and yet we believe. There's this sense of elevating Jesus elevating the, the faith, the belief of people like us who we don't see him, we believe him. We believe in him. And then just the next few verses, uh, John, the writer of this gospel, in his writing as an author, he gets so excited uh, in his writing that he's, he's, he's going to land this plane. He's like, this is the high watermark. This is the climax of the story. He says, in his writing, he points out that this is the reason that I wrote this book. This is the reason I wrote the entire Gospel of John, is that you might believe. He says this, John 20, the next verse, he says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Many other signs. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Amen. Amen. Oh, that we might, might this, this Christmas season, in new and fresh ways, oh, that we might embrace the deity of Jesus, that he was God. And oh, that we might embrace fully the preeminence of Christ. He is superior. He is above all all. Why? So that we may have life in the name of Jesus. Smile big, my friends. Embrace that truth. Hold on to that truth. Be a hope-filled child of God today. Merry Christmas. All right, friends. Well, that's a wrap for today. I, listen, I, 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 consider it such a privilege. I'm so honored that you allow me to come into your home every week and, and lead you in worship and, and teach you. Uh, the ministry of River Church, it's a gift. It's a gift to bless you, um, but it does cost something. Uh, and so if you're able, 
I encourage you to, to, to go online, to go to our website now, riverchurchrgv.com, and, and give. Uh, if you're a faithful member of River Church, then you've been giving for a long time, and you, I would encourage you to continue to do so. Uh, go and give online. It's safe. It's intuitive. Uh, it's quick and easy and fun, and many of you have been doing that for a long time. I encourage some of you new people to go online and, and give to the ministry of, of River Church. Now, I want to say a little bit more about our gospel community offerings. Those are our small groups, our, our Bible studies and ways that you can connect. We've got some co-ed groups, some ladies groups, some men's groups. If you'll go to the website now, uh, you'll find a, an easy way to, to one-click to sign up for, for our gospel communities. If you're getting out and about and you want to be in a group that meets in a home, uh, then, then that's awesome. We have some opportunities like that, and you'll see those. Uh, maybe you're not ready to get out, but you would like to be able to virtually connect with people, do a Bible study, a gospel community online, several of those available. And you can go to the website, and in just a really few quick and easy clicks, you'll be signed up, and then we'll get you more information. So do that. Uh, go there. If you have any questions about River Church, send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, and we, your elders, will serve you pray for you in any way that we can. Love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day.